Welcome everyone for joining us today for this, our latest installment of our More Chat. Uh, for those that don't know, these are 10 minute talks with one of our experts uh, within, within Walter P. Moore. And today's topic is enclosure waterproofing done right. And uh, speaking today for us is Annie Lowe, uh, licensed architect. We are primarily an engineering firm, but we, we do have a few architects on board as well. Uh, Annie is one of those. Uh, Annie is a principal and, and managing director uh, for our diagnostics group in, in San Francisco. Uh, she has more than 15 years of experience in the field of forensic architecture, building enclosure design and historic preservation. Annie's expertise includes assessing and designing repairs for building distresses related to below grade waterproofing, plaza and podium assemblies, facades, exterior walls, fenestration, roofing, and so on. Uh, she, she manages and performs very, various facility condition assessments that, that involve structural waterproofing and uh, renovation restoration of enclosures and facades. I, I, do, uh, I do hope you can join me in welcoming uh, Annie to this installment of More Chat. And with that, Annie, it is, it is all yours. Thank you. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for tuning into more chat this week. I'll be going over the five C's that are critical to making sure your building enclosure waterproofing is done right. And I've thought about this over the course of many years in which I've been providing waterproofing consultation and you know living through a lot of different types of projects and buildings. So there are a few basic things to remember. One, to getting an enclosure waterproofing consultant on board. Two, think about the waterproofing from the commencement of the project. Three, make sure the waterproofing will be continuous across the entire building enclosure. Four, check the compatibility of materials. And five, review the construction and installation of the waterproofing membrane systems. I'll go over my thoughts on each of these items and we'll open it up to questions at the very end. So the first critical point is to get an enclosure waterproofing consultant on board. Projects really are complex, and I think the earlier you get a consultant on board, the better off you'll be in terms of the course of your design, risk management, and even construction budgeting. As consultants, I think we really do a good job helping you figure out what the waterproofing and roofing systems for proper systems should be from the beginning of the project. And we can look at what major elements and transitions will be encountered based on the design and the configuration. And for example, in this photo, uh, in this project image, we would basically hone in on the different transitions, the roof to wall transition, the tie in between the glazing interface and the opaque facade materials. And we would likely review the plaza waterproofing as it transitions to the below grade foundation waterproofing if you have any subgrade levels. I think an enclosure waterproofing consultant can really help you avoid this kind of scenario where the building and the structure basically has been damaged by water intrusion. We are often asked to visit these types of buildings uh, with these kind of issues and we are asked to resolve the problems. Most of the time I believe you know these kind of issues can be avoided in the original design and construction of the building, especially if there was a consultant on board to help advise on the details to review things before they were actually installed. The consultant's advisement and review of the waterproofing systems should really happen at the commencement of the project. And we usually wanna aim for multiple lines of defense, meaning that we design more than one layer of protection in the waterproofing systems. I think a trend that we often see as enclosure waterproofing consultants is that we are brought in too late in the game on a project. And if the design is already done and all of the waterproofing systems have already been decided on, then it's very difficult for us to provide much value if there cannot be any changes made on the project. So I think, you know, word of advice is to engage your consultants early so that they can help incorporate good waterproofing detailing and to build in several lines of waterproofing defense. Many people probably don't realize how complex details can be in order to achieve maybe something as simple as this garden terrace. There are basically various waterproofing details that need to be coordinated from the beginning of the project. Uh, the review of the membrane system underneath the decking boards, the membrane system underneath the topping slab, the flashing at the base of the trellis posts, 
the rough opening flashing and waterproofing around the glazed storefront systems, and even other trellis elements or facade elements that anchor back uh, through the curtain wall or facade materials. All of those things have to be reviewed in order to create um, you know, a successful project that will not have any water intrusion. So on to principle three, I think the continuity of waterproofing is something that is very important, and this needs to be intact for every project and design from the beginning of a project. If you can't draw a continuous line across the perimeter of the building or around the silhouette of your building section, then I think like, likely there's going to be some water improvement. Um, intrusion issues that you might face. And typically, those issues will happen at the transition between elements, likely between the vertical and horizontal interfaces, when you have different membrane systems coming together. All of those details really need to be reviewed well um, and are ensured to provide continuous waterproofing. Another way I think we can think about waterproofing continuity is to really understand whether the sequence of construction will actually support the intent of having continuous waterproofing. This photo is a really great example of a nice piece of architecture. However, the glass curtain wall was basically installed before any of the waterproofing or flashing went in. So that should usually happen at the perimeter of any fenestration system. And since it wasn't installed, all of the glass curtain wall is already anchored into the structure, and it's quite impossible to properly install waterproofing and flashing at this point in the game. This likely, I think, could have been avoided um, if there was a little bit more communication and coordination um, in the project in order to achieve, achieve continuous waterproofing. So we have to make sure that all of the tools are in, in place in order to make sure that happens. The next critical C in enclosure waterproofing is compatibility of materials. I think chemistry is very important, and so is the bond strength and adhesion between different products. Either of these can mean the difference, I think, between a good and bad seal when it comes to your waterproofing systems on the building. And the truth is, I think we don't always know how materials will perform or react in contact with one another. Testing those material compatibilities and combinations early on in the project can likely help you eliminate a lot of different risks or issues that may arise further down the line. In this photo, uh, you can see it's a sealant pull test against the backside facer of different self-adhered membranes. And the sealant that's being lifted up here is not properly bonded to the substrate. And if you think about this on a larger scale of a building enclosure and what this incompatibility could mean, you could be facing a lot of risk. The compatibility of materials also means, I think, selecting the right waterproofing membrane and system for the different substrates that it'll be going over. I think as consultants, we're often evaluating, you know, the capacity of those different substrates, the condition that they're in. And we look at membrane characteristics such as their permeability, their elongation, um, you know, a few characteristics um, that we ha really have to review in order to make sure it's appropriate. And during this process, we might look at, you know, do we want a liquid applied membrane or a fluid applied membrane? Should there be membrane sheets or protection sheets that are part of the assembly? And, you know, what materials will the waterproofing really be going over? brick or concrete, plywood sheathing, possibly metal flashing. And the last but not least, I think critical C um, in the concept of making sure your waterproofing is done right is to review the construction. This is a very important step. And we wanna make sure the waterproofing and the systems conform to the construction documents, both the drawings and the specifications. We wanna make sure the consultant who's reviewed those waterproofing details is visiting the site um, on a regular basis to review the install, um, especially of the waterproofing and the membrane, um, the flashing systems, you know, making sure at critical milestones things are reviewed. Basically, you know, the point is to get it all documented during the construction process, make sure things are done right. So those construction reviews and observations will really help reduce your risk and any potential issues that might come up later down the line in the project. I think construction review of the waterproofing systems is especially critical uh, for non-conventional building processes, such as modular construction or prefabricated construction. 
And the sequence um, of these type of projects in the install of the waterproofing is often a different path in um, these type of projects. And the waterproofing will likely need to be reviewed at different phases in the project, likely inside the modular shop or the prefab shop um, before these elements even arrive on the construction site. And when they do arrive on the construction site, I think they also need to be reviewed again to make sure the waterproofing is not disrupted as part of the transportation. So in conclusion, the five Cs that can help us better protect uh, buildings from an enclosure waterproofing standpoint, these are very critical points. And uh, you know, we hope that if you ever need advice or help on your building, that you'll reach out to us and that we can give you our opinion on uh, how to do it right. So I really appreciate your time and for tuning in today. Thanks so much. One of the things that I've heard, Annie, and, and you know, reasons why perhaps uh, enclosure or waterproofing consultants aren't hired uh, or aren't retained for every project is the added cost, right? Not, not every construction project is the same uh, with, with regard to budget uh, for new construction. And a lot of times for existing uh, evaluations, ex existing building evaluations, there are certain maintenance staff and a lot of times uh, contractors are used for in kind of in substitution of an enclosure consultant. And, and then a lot of this boils down to the added cost of, of an enclosure consultant or waterproofing consultant for either a new or existing building uh, assessment or consulting. What what would you say in response to that? Yeah, you know, I'm sure you've heard that. And what are the, some of the things and, and reasons that uh, that you can give to a concerned uh, owner or someone that would that would be interested in hiring an enclosure waterproofing consultant, but is unsure of whether they can absorb the cost or not? Sure. I mean, I think we're we're known as expensive consultants, um, but we do provide a lot of value. I think for clients who are very budget conscious on their projects. Um, I would recommend, you know, let us help you scope the project. Um, we know by looking at a project what might be the most challenging, I think, waterproofing scenarios and interfaces. And we can help craft a scope, I think, for the best use of our time to help advise on what needs to be done properly. So, you know, instead of maybe five different rounds of review of the drawings, maybe we have one or two work sessions to kind of go over the whole project and look at it at a more in-depth level and do some live consulting, um, I think would be a much better use of, of our time and also the client's time. Um, if we can get in there early and help them scope the project and not have to prescribe something that, you know, may not be a great use of time for the overall project. So I think that we're often faced with that challenge um, and just last week, even with one of my clients, we were, we were looking at what budget was available and what we could actually fit in and provide the best value for. Uh, customization of, of scope is, is kind of what, what I'm hearing as well. And, and yeah. I guess that's, 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 uh, that's one of the ways in which we navigate that. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, there is another question here from Karen, uh, Karen O'Kane. It says contractors and waterproofing consultants are not always on the same page when it comes to product recommendations. Annie, how do you reconcile these differences? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, happens on almost every project. Um, you know, for us, I always say you want to listen to both parties, actually. You know, the consultant really has the technical view of what products might be good. And the contractor has a viewpoint of what's going to be easiest in terms of install and also, um, you know, in some regards, fitting to the budget. Um, both those things have to be considered well in order to really approve a product. We don't want to approve it from one angle only without consideration of the others. Um, so I think, you know, it's that dialogue of making sure you're communicating and coordinating. Um, so, you know, both parties are part of the team. And, you know, all of this is in the end teamwork to make successful projects. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, but I was wondering, how do you evaluate a new waterproofing membrane that has just entered the market? That's a great question. Um, it, it's challenging most of the times, actually. You know, new products, we, we don't know much about their performance history. Um, you can talk to the manufacturer and see what they've tested those, uh, you know, membrane and properties to. Um, but oftentimes, you know, we may want to take on membrane testing um, ourselves and kind of see how that works over time, because a new product in the market, 
won't have something like a five-year track, 10-year track, or even 20-year track, which is what we like to see um, as known performance um, for products. And it's hard to specify something that we don't know how it's going to perform at all. So I think you got to tread with caution. Um, oftentimes, we're going to look into it ourselves as well and have a lot of dialogue with the manufacturer. Annie, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I would remember the five Cs. Uh, question for you. How do you determine what the correct yellow grade waterproofing system should be for a project, uh, specifically for a greenfield project or new construction? You know, we when we start a new construction project and we're looking at the foundation waterproofing system, we need to start with the geotechnical report with a good understanding of what the water table levels are going to be. We're basically evaluating, you know, the proximity um, of water reaching the concrete structure. So looking at that, you know, say if it's a five feet type of uh, distance, that's pretty close for water to touch the concrete. We may want something like a very good membrane system. If we were in a drier zone and the water table levels were maybe 50 feet, below the actual structure or bottom of basement slab, then we might get away with something like a vapor barrier or a vapor retarder. So I think you gotta look at, you know, those water elevations that are reported by the geotechnical engineer. Hi Annie, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so like, how do you know if the waterproofing was actually done right or not? And like further, like if you are a property manager or building owner, uh, what are the early signs that your waterproofing may be failing or has reached its life and got to call a consultant to look at it? Great question. Um, you know, we do a lot of evaluation of existing structures that are leaking. And oftentimes it takes some exploratory openings to find out. I think there are some visual signs, like you can look for staining. I mean, leaks themselves, if you see dripping water, that's a pretty dead giveaway. Um, but anything that you see on the surface could definitely indicate something of a more serious problem underneath. So we usually recommend some exploratory openings. You know, there's been some projects that we've been called back to um, look at from a maintenance standpoint, maybe a year after the construction is complete or five years after, just to make sure everything that was designed and installed is performing properly. So, you know, your consultants can also help you in that regard because they have an eye for those kind of things. Um, if not, and it's an existing structure that maybe nobody really knows what was installed in the beginning, I think we would recommend something like an exploratory opening to find out more. Hi, Annie. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one quick question for you. Um, when you're reviewing design documents or you're reviewing construction in place, are there any like typical locations or details that you frequently initially review to determine a, a rough approximation or an initial estimate of how well the waterproofing was designed and constructed? Sure. I, I think I usually go to the critical interfaces. So like when we know the exterior wall membrane is transitioning to the plaza waterproofing system, um, you know, where the roof will transition to the exterior wall, those major transitions I think we'll hone in on at first. Um, you can always then break it down to more finite details like expansion joints, you know, control joints, um, things that happen within each waterproofing membrane itself. Um, but certainly, you know, in each uh, round of review during schematic design or design development or construction documents, you know, we are we are looking for different things and we're looking for further development to make sure all of those transitions are addressed. If we don't see that in the set of drawings, we're usually, you know, listing that out to our clients to let them know, hey, you know, we, we see this missing and we, we recommend this be detailed so that at least we can review it um, before construction begins. My understanding is that um, uh, in, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, my friends in the trades uh, tell me that uh, waterproofing con consultants are required for all permitted projects. Uh, do you see that um, any indication of that happening stateside or in California even? Uh, you know, given the, the the importance of what we do, um, you know, it, it's a it's 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 the, the waterproofing uh, consultants have uh, you know been around for the last twenty years or so. But I'm finding that locally here in New York, you know, the, they're they're uh, quite frequently involved with projects, but it's still an elective process. Uh, do you find that in California that you know there's a move to perhaps make it uh, a mandate? Uh, since California seems to be always on the forefront of, of you know, cutting edge 
codes and requirements? I think it would be a great initiative. Um, you know, I haven't really seen it in the United States as much. I think possibly Seattle and Washington State have something similar in place. I haven't seen it in California yet, but I okay. think it would be great if it was. We, we consult with a lot of design architects who sometimes do design the waterproofing on their own. Um, so whether or not it's mandated that you must hire a waterproofing consultant um, may be a little bit far out, but I think, you know, the trend that we've seen really like California, even New York, right, is that most of um, the new construction projects nowadays, um, there is an enclosure and a waterproofing consultant on board just for that quality control. And yeah. I'm very happy about, you know, that kind of review being put in place because, you know, it took a long time to get here. It took a lot of um, maybe failures and, and bad mistakes um, for us to realize the importance of uh, waterproofing and what and what it can do for projects. Yeah. So hopefully soon, Ed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not really a life safety issue. So it's difficult to actually build it into the code because that's the primary mandate of, of building codes, obviously. But um, somehow they've seen um, seen fit to, to, to make it a mandated part of the construction process in, in Vancouver. But you know, Vancouver and Seattle both receive a lot of rain, so that that, right. that explains that. But sure, sure. I mean, I, I really do think water intrusion can sometimes even, um, you know, amount to life safety issues, because yep. if you let a lot of water into your structure, it deteriorates the structural members. Things start to collapse and fall, yep. and it's it's not worth it yep. <laughs> for for you know human lives i mean doing your waterproofing right is is critical and can mean the difference between possibly someone's life so yeah i mean yeah. certainly in new york we've broken uh, rain records uh, twice in the last mm. month right and, you know most recently several people did die but um yeah i think i think that is going to be something that we should all uh, look toward you know the increasing frequency of extreme climate events you know on, on our buildings I had a question related to the last in relation to the, you know, damage that we've seen from Hurricane Ida and, and other events that we're, we're seeing here in the U.S. Um, what, what, what can we do from a waterproofing design perspective to design for, to have more resiliency in our, in our designs, in our buildings? What, what kind of philosophies and techniques can we use? You know, I think redundancy is an important thing. It's not one of the, the five C's, but along with, you know, continuity and also, you know, commencement of project, I think you want to build in those multiple layers of defense. If you have only one line and it's going to fail easily or a storm might, you know, arrive and, you know, take out that one layer, you really have nothing left to protect your structure. So I would really recommend building in um, more lines of defense and redundancy in the waterproofing systems. Um, and, you know, a lot of these uh, hurricanes and natural disasters that are really happening, we, we may not be able to avoid all of them. We, we won't be able to say that we can protect your structure from earthquakes or things that, you know, seismic events that can cause major waterproofing um, failures. But beyond the waterproofing, you got a lot more things to worry about, too, at that point. So I would say, you know, don't go with the most basic um, type of waterproofing, you know, buy something good. It's worth the money. It's worth the protection of your structure and also some human lives. Great questions. Thank you for those. Were there any other questions out there? Well, Annie, I think you, I think you answered most everyone's concerns. You might get some, get some lingering thoughts come your way after, after the presentation, but uh, certainly, certainly thank you for your time as well as the time of, of all who, uh, who attended today. And um, I look forward to having you uh, attend our next more chat session. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to email me too if you have any questions. Appreciate your time.